Coming up, three celebs become 12 again. I had ridiculously spiky hair, and I can always remember having to make sure that it was perfect. We had school food. School food wasn't, wasn't great. Actually, I was one of these girls like, no, I haven't got time for a boyfriend. I'm concentrating on my career. <laughs> Plus, we catch up with Britain's Got Talent star, Ronan Park. I just feel like I'm doing things that I really love. And it's, I don't know, I don't feel like a celebrity. <laughs> Want to know what they're all talking about? Well, have you ever wondered what it would have been like to be best mates with your favourite celebs when they were your age? What did they get up to? What were their favourite songs? And what TV shows did they watch? Because despite the glamorous lifestyles they now lead, once they were a kid with a dream just like you. This show lets you look back in time with your favourite celebs as they become 12 again. She is the best dancing, singing, presenting TV judge there is in showbiz. Fun, flirty and fearless. Your confidence is growing, I can really feel that. You just need to refine some of your steps. That's now, but in 1990, Alicia Dixon was a girl who was seriously interested in growing up. When I was 12 years old, I was an adult trapped in a young person's body. <laughs> I always felt like I knew more than I should at 12. He's the somersaulting, twisting, backflipping, crow hopping, gold medal winning star diver. But in 2006, Tom Daly was just starting to make waves. When I was 12, I think that was the age when I started to get a little bit of attitude. I started to become a bit more grown up and a bit more independent. I used to start answering back and then as soon as I answered back, I'd be like, Good morning, this is Breakfast with Sean Williams and Bill Turnbull. He's a chilled out newsreader who has breakfast with the entire country every morning. It's lovely, lovely. That's now, but in 1968, Bill Turnbull wasn't all that calm and content. I suppose I was sort of quite a cheerful child. I, I remember I used to worry an awful lot. Sort of constantly worry, which was good, because I got it all out of my system. <laughs> All are massive celebs today, and for the first time ever, we're going to find out everything about what they were like when they were kids. So let's meet their 12-year-old selves. I was goofy. It was before the days I had braces. Friends of mine that see photographs of me when I was 12, they say, you look the same. When I was 12, I was sort of felt a little bit chubby. I wasn't very proud of my looks at that time. I had ridiculously spiky hair. When you see girls in the playground, I used to like spike them with it. I can always remember using it as a bit of a weapon rather than <laughs> for it to look good. When I was 12, uh, I had fair hair. I had a very straightforward fringe, which I hated. The other kids had sort of stiffer, firmer hair and it did stuff, but not me, it's just like... I wasn't one of those girly girls. I was more of a tomboy. And I remember having a conversation with my nan when I was about 12 and she was like, when are you going to wear dresses? And I'm like, Nan, I'll wear a dress when I feel like wearing a dress. When they weren't arguing with their grandparents over what to wear, what else did our celebs get up to? Well, when I was 12, the only thing that I knew I wanted to be was a diver and wanted to compete in the Olympic Games, and that was kind of my main idea. I had qualified for the Commonwealth Games, travelled to loads of different countries like Australia, Canada, um, America and it was I can just remember it being the, the year a year where I it was kind of where I first stepped onto the senior circuit it all changed and got a bit more serious really so while Tom was traveling the world Bill's world only belonged in school school I went to was a boarding school and it was very strict every last minute virtually of the day was regulated we had very little free time and very little room for self-expression so from the moment we woke up, a bell rang us all up in our dormitories and we'd get up, get dressed, put our uniforms on, brush our teeth and all that. And then before we even had breakfast, we had to go to chapel. As soon as that was finished, then we had to do our, usually our Latin constru, where we had to sit and translate Latin. I wonder if Alicia did that. I was one of the rare people that genuinely loved school. I was a part of the EZ posse, and there was about six of us girls, we were all in the same form. Guess not. We were quite notorious at the school, everybody knew who the EZ posse were. Quite opinionated, loud girls. 
and we used to make up routines together, dance routines. When I think of school, I think of those girls because we went through the whole experience together and we're still friends to this day. We had school food. School food wasn't, <laughs> wasn't great. I used to get very tense about the food. We had all sorts of tough, dark meat things. Yeah, cabbage that's been cooked to death. One time we got served something which had tubes coming out of it. I don't want to know what that was. And sometimes the food was really hard to eat. And I remember once I did actually put it in my pocket. Mm. It was leeks. I remember being 12 years old and writing out a diary for myself. This is going to sound bizarre. Even if it was something as simple as going to the shops, homework, whatever activities I was doing throughout the day, I would plan my day. And my diary now is exactly the same, like from morning till I go to bed, there's always something during the day. And in a way, it's kind of like how my life's always been. And, and that works for me because I am somebody that likes, I like a bit of order and I like things to be kind of in place and and I think I was like that 12 as well, weirdly. When I was 12, I didn't have a crush on anyone in particular because I was doing my school, I was training and things like that. I just didn't really even think about anything like that. So Tom was too busy for girls, but could Alicia break herself from the EZ posse for a crush? I did have a crush on somebody at school, specifically Brady Gallifum, and he did ask me out one day. But I, I, I didn't want to go. <laughs> it was weird. It almost having a crush on someone was was all was all I needed. I didn't really want to have a boyfriend. Actually, I was one of these girls like, no, I haven't got time for a boyfriend. I'm concentrating on my career. <laughs> so Alicia may have been more worried about her career than boyfriends. But what sort of music were our three celebs listening to? I can remember the Rihanna song, uh, Umbrella, when I was 12, because it was, uh, like, it was number one for absolutely ages. When the sun shine, we shine together Told you I'll be here forever Said I'll always be a friend Everything that you used to say, you used to have to pronounce it at the last syllable with Ella Ella quite a few times, but it was... But yeah, I can remember it changed the vocabulary of many young people at that age. Not only did the song seem to change people's vocabulary, sorry, I mean vocabulary, it also appeared as if it had a bad effect on the weather. While this song was number Ella, sorry, number one, Britain happened to have some of the worst floods in recent history. The coincidence led the Sun newspaper to think the song was cursed and the floods will stop if Umbrella was knocked off number one. The funny thing was, it did. Of course, it was all a coincidence. Or was it? That definitely was. So let's see what Alicia was listening to. Musically, I, I loved so much, so this is a hard question for me, but somebody who I really loved was Paula Abdul from The American X Factor because she is an incredible dancer. Before her huge success on The American X Factor, in the 80s and 90s, Paula Abdul is one of America's biggest female pop artists. But it was Paula's rapping cartoon Cat that might have had the biggest influence on Alicia. She used to have some incredible videos. The one with the cat being my favorite, <laughs> Scat Cat. There's a little story and you're sure to like it. Swift and sly and I'm playing it cool with my homegirl, Paula. That's how I became an MC because of that cat. Could you imagine? I have to thank, you know, <laughs> MC Scat Cat <laughs> for teaching me how to MC. <laughs> Yes, this really is Alicia Dixon way before becoming the star of Saturday Night TV that we know today. Alicia was known as a shouty, rappy one from the girl band Mystique. I think it was 3-4 on those tracksuits. I didn't start rapping until I was uh, 17, 18. Music was always my passion and my love, but how naive of me to go through school saying, I'm going to be a singer. I, it just wasn't something I could say or verbalise, even though it was a passion. But at 12 years old, I didn't know that it could be a career, apart from my friend Sean Lewis, who turned to me in class one day and said, you're going to be a pop star one day. And I looked at her like she was an alien. Like, who says that? You know, to me, that was just otherworldly. 
OK, let's leave Alicia rapping to her heart's content and hop back to 1968 to find out if Bill was listening to a bit of the old rap. We weren't allowed radios. Thought not. Let alone, well, they didn't have CDs. They were record players. We couldn't have those. So no rap then. When you had got to the age of 12, you were allowed a transistor radio. Mr Rankin, the old math teacher, uh, put on the radio and we listened to Pick of the Pops and number one was Jumping Jack Flash by the Rolling Stones. Radio One had just started, um, so it was in its infancy and we were listening to sort of everything we could get our ears on because there was, there was no commercial radio. Before the launch of Radio One, the only cool radio station you could listen to were pirate stations. Not that type of pirate, although some of them did broadcast illegally from ships just off the coast. When Bill was a kid, Radio One was brand new and quickly became the UK's favourite station. Just for fun, music, too much. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the exciting new sound of Radio One. It was super cool. Uh, this long progression of programmes from um, Tony Blackburn, Terry Wogan in the afternoon, and then gradually we creep towards real music in the evening. And uh, the, I suppose the highlight was John Peel. John Peel was a DJ that played the latest cutting-edge music and is considered a hero to many radio DJs today. I felt so happy one night when I was working in the BBC Broadcasting House and I went up to the canteen and there in the queue next to me was John Peel having a supper and I thought, gosh, that's really... I'm finally in the room, same room as the great man. <laughs> Wonderful. Still to come, we catch up with Ronan Park and find out what it's like to become famous at 12. My mum and dad and like my friends were really, really shocked that I auditioned for a talent show. Who is the patron saint of travellers? Alicia and Bill reveal some of the best game show prizes there was to win on TV. Cuddly toy! Yeah. Can you imagine going on a quiz show today and coming away with a pencil? And Tom teaches a Blue Peter presenter to dive. Yeah, kind of. But first we find out what big news stories were hitting the headlines when our three celebrities were 12. I remember the World Cup being a massive deal. Hello again. England's hopes of World Cup glory finally ended last night when they were beaten by West Germany in a last gasp penalty shootout. Yes, 1990 World Cup will be remembered for the England team doing what they do best, losing. But in this World Cup, there was one big moment that has gone down in footballing history. One of the things I remember was obviously Paul Gascoigne crying, which is an image that we all know and all remember. Paul Gascoigne, the Wayne Rooney of the day, made headline news when he started crying after getting a yellow card, meaning he would miss the final if England went through. But you needn't worry, Paul, because they didn't. I remember the song more than I do the actual football. The official World Cup song, which was a song by New Order, it really captured, I think, the spirit of the country at the time. Since 1990, World Cups have come and gone, and England are still waiting for that winning moment. Maybe one day, I just wouldn't hold your breath. In 2007, when Tom was 12, a huge story shocked the nation. Welcome to News Round and first to the little girl who went missing on holiday. I can remember uh, when I was 12 hearing about Madeleine McCann. Madeleine McCann disappeared from her family's holiday apartment in Portugal on the 3rd of May 2007. When her family discovered she was missing, a massive search for her began. If you have seen this little girl, please could you go to your local authorities or police and give any information that you have. Her disappearance was incredibly shocking and had a huge effect on everyone in the country. To think that a little girl like her and so close to me is, is just very unreal really and it's horrid. I feel really upset for the parents and, the, and I want Marilyn to return safely. It was quite a scary thing to hear about because it was something that you'd never expect to happen and it kind of made things feel like not everything was safe anymore. The campaign to try and find Madeline was huge. The country came together and many people wanted to help the search for her. She became one of the most recognisable faces in the world. 
2007 will always be remembered as the year Madeleine McCann went missing. In 1968, Bill was exploring new frontiers. We have commit, we have, we have liftoff. Liftoff at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Apollo 8 was a really groundbreaking mission towards the, the end of the year. It was the first time they put a rocket round the back of the moon. The crew of Apollo 8 were the first ever people to leave planet Earth and travel around the moon. It took three days to get there and they had to travel half a million miles. The crew were seen as heroes as no one knew if they would ever return. The tension mounted as Apollo 8 went behind the moon and communications were cut off. I remember this historically there was a gap when they went around the back of the moon and they, there was radio silence and you weren't sure if you're ever going to hear from them again. So you waited and waited and it was like shh, and then finally the signal came back and they'd made it. While orbiting the moon on Christmas Eve, astronauts Bill Anders and his crew took photographs of our planet. The photographs are one of history's most important pictures. It was also the first time you got amazing images of the Earth from the distance and perspective of, of the moon. And I, it, it was, in some ways, it was, it was all, felt almost as important as landing on the moon itself, which happened the next year, because you knew once they'd done that, they could actually then go and land. And that's exactly what happened. A year later, a man actually did land on the moon. But the crew of the Apollo 8 will always be a part of one of the most important space missions ever taken. Still to come, we ask the all-important question, what would our celebs do if they were 12 again? 12 is a weird age, I've got to say that. The best thing for me about being 12 was just feeling I was beginning to grow up a bit. You're getting to that age where people start to talk to you about future prospects and future career possibilities and, you know, the big wide world seems quite daunting when you're 12. But first we caught up with Ronan Park and he told us about his amazing 12th year in two minutes. Making my way downtown. He started his 12th year as a normal kid in Norfolk. He ended it with a record contract and was about to release his first music video. So what made Ronan Park enter Britain's Got Talent? My mum and dad and like my friends were really, really shocked that I auditioned. I just sort of did it out of the blue. I didn't want to tell anyone in case anyone tried to talk me out of it, so. Before I auditioned, it was completely different to what it is now because there's people recognising me going around the country doing all kind of gigs and stuff. I just feel like I'm doing things that I really love and it's, I don't know, I don't feel like a celebrity. <laughs> While Shronan is adjusting to celebrity life, what kind of music does he listen to? My favourite artists are Lady Gaga and Beyonce. I want to be as successful as like them. I'd love to do that, like tour around the world. Like, that would be amazing. But Ronan's dreams of being as big as his idols were almost ruined when he was getting ready for the biggest performance of his life, the Britain's Got Talent final. Someone posted lies about Ronan on the internet claiming that the competition was a fix. During the show, there was also like negative press as well. There was a blogging thing that went out um, on the internet saying that Simon Cowell like trained me to go on Britain's Got Talent. None of it was true and when I was reading it I just laughed because I thought how could people come up with stupid things like that. For what I've experienced if someone was being bullied I'd just say to them to be strong, ignore the bully and tell someone. You've always got to tell someone. If I could just But despite all this, he didn't let it spoil his time on Britain's Got Talent. If I was 12 again, I think I'd just love to do it all over again because I had such an amazing experience. I'm glad he enjoyed it. Right, let's get back to our three celebs as we find out what they are watching on telly when they were 12. And Tom liked two very different shows. When I was 12, there was loads of things that I used to watch on TV at that age. I can remember being obsessed with Dick and Dom in the bungalow. I used to love anything like with a bit of humour and things like that. And I used to love all the Blue Peter things. 
making loads of different things and collecting all the, I think those like shoe appeals and things like that. All those kind of things were, were really good fun. I appeared first on Blue Peter when I was 12. Hi, I'm Tom Daly, I'm 12 years old and I'm from Plymouth and I want to win an Olympic gold medal in diving. Not only did Tom show off a few of his diving skills, but he also gave Blue Peter presenter Gethin a few diving lessons. Which went terribly. Ouch. You're absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure there's a lot more success coming your way. And to say a big thank you for today, here's your very own Blue Peter badge. Thank you. And I can remember getting the Blue Peter badge. It was really cool to get that because I can remember always watching Blue Peter and wanting to get a badge, but then to actually be given one was really cool. So on one hand, Tom liked Dick and Dom. <laughs> but on the other, you like Blue Peter. Congratulations and thanks to all of you who have sent in your shoes. Two very different shows. But in 1968, there was only one show that was special for Bill. When it came to children's programmes when I was 12, the one show we all remember was Crackerjack, which is live. Well, they said it was live. You know, it's Friday, it's five to five, it's Crackerjack! <laughs> We have a real cracker of a programme lined up for you. Cracker Jack was on our telly from 1955 to 1984. Cracker Jack! They made over 400 episodes of Cracker Jack. All right, that's enough of that. The main part of the show is a game called Double or Drop. So you're not running short of prizes, Gillian? Oh, no, we have manicure sets, table tennis sets. So when these wonderful prizes, kids were asked questions and would have to hold their prizes, if they got the answer right. But if they got the answer wrong, they'd have to hold on to a cabbage. Cabbage. And something, you know, would then pile up until you dropped one. Oh! But who could lose with such easy questions like this? You tell me, what was the state of Ghana formerly called? See? Easy! All right, so all cabbage for you. Still, not all was lost if you didn't win the game. Your consolation prize was always that you got a priceless gift to take home, a Cracker Jack pencil. And here's your special Cracker Jack pen and pencil. Can you imagine going on a quiz show today and coming away with a pencil? I don't know, Bill. That kid looks pretty excited, stroke terrified. Let go of his arm! Anyway, while Bill was all about Friday evening, Alicia was all about Saturday night. Monday to Friday, at school, Friday would come and you'd think, yes, it's Saturday tomorrow. And you'd have your fun during the day, whether it was going to town, hanging out with friends, doing whatever you were doing. And then Saturday night, you'd always look forward to Saturday night TV. You really did look forward to the big shows. And I was just, you know, cuddle up with mum on the sofa, a cup of tea, rich tea biscuits. Generation Game, here we come. And I wanna play the game with you. The Generation Game had many hosts, but when Alicia was 12, there was one TV legend who she is now very familiar with. Thank you very much, Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen and children. Welcome to The Generation Game. Nice to see you, to see you. Nice! Nice to see you, to see you. Nice! Yep, that's right. It's our very own Bruce Forsyth. Brucey is an institution. He is incredible. The fact that we used to sit there when we were young, watching him on all of his shows, and now he's still up there as a legend on Strictly Come Dancing, is just amazing. When Alicia was 12, the Generation Game and Brucey had not been on TV since the 70s, where he was doing, well, the same thing he always does. Nice to see you, to see you again. <laughs> The teams on the Generation Game were family members who took on other families at challenges based on fun activities. You know, fun things such as plate spinning, chiselling, no idea what that is. The show climaxed with a memory game where you had to remember your prizes. I remember the conveyor belt where you had to guess all the items and you get to keep all the items and I was always terrible at that. Video recorder, espresso coffee maker. But the prize everyone remembered was... Cuddly toy! <laughs> a cuddly teddy bear! 
There was always this running gag at the end. There'd always be the cuddly toy and some dodgy appliance. And obviously everyone remembers the cuddly toy, but that's never what you wanted to take home. <laughs> The show ran for 23 years, uh, until they ran out of cuddly toys. So, those were the TV memories of our three celebs, but what do they remember the most about being 12? 12 is a weird age, I've got to say that. <laughs> Thinking about it now, I did feel a lot older when I was 12, and I felt like I was quite an old person. But then, looking back on it now, I do remember how young I must have actually been and how different it actually feels inside your head when you're 12. I think being 12 is a difficult age because you're on the cusp of being a teenager. You're finding yourself, you're discovering your body, you're discovering who you are as a person. You're getting to that age where people start to talk to you about future prospects and future career possibilities and, you know, the big wide world seems quite daunting when you're 12. A couple of pieces of advice for my 12-year-old self. One is Try not to worry so much. You know, I used to worry all the time. I'd worry about everything. And it's just wasted energy. I do remember feeling quite adult at 12. Even though to an adult I would have looked like a child, I remember feeling like an adult. I think you're going through a bit of an identity crisis because you're just coming out of the young phase, the primary school era, and now you're entering into secondary school. And it's all, everything's a little bit more serious and slightly more grown up and a bigger minefield. And it's just, it's an interesting age. I would say to my 12 year old self that you just gotta go out there, enjoy yourself, have fun, and find something that you like to do, stick with something, and pay attention to detail when you're doing something. The best thing for me about being 12 was just feeling I was beginning to grow up a bit. Just beginning to make more sense of the world, learning more grown-up subjects, and just use the part of our brains that we didn't before. If I were 12 again, I would go into my diving career with more motivation, more inspiration. Knowing everything that I know now, there's so much more experience that I've had, and the only way that you can get success and make sure that you're at the top of your game is by a lot of hard work and dedication. For some reason, even at 12, remember thinking that life is a gift and you must make the most of it, and that's what I tried to do. But the only thing cool is being yourself and not worrying about what people think. So, what have we learned? If you're ever on a game show, make sure you brush up on your African geography. What was the state of Ghana formerly called? Even if you're a gold medal winning diver, it doesn't make you a great teacher. Ouch. And if you're ever going to choose a TV catchphrase, make sure it can stand the test of time. Nice to see you. To see you. Yeah.